Hello, Laurie. Fantastic to have you on the show today. Really looking forward to our conversation. You too. Thank you for having me, Katie. It's a real pleasure and I've been following your content for a while and I love everything you do in terms of growing your business and your audience. And also, I feel that you have a very humanized way of doing marketing, which is so inspiring for coaches like myself. I'd be really curious to know, I'm sure my audience would love to also, to know how did this journey for you begin? How did it all begin? Yeah, so for me, um, I was actually a financial analyst when I first started out my career. So this was literally at the end of the subprime crisis. And as you can imagine, the whole industry completely shifted and everything on, on its head. I remember for me, when I was starting out, you know, I was thinking about, so my, my original aim was that I want to build a career in finance and eventually become rising to the ladders, eventually, you know, making to that level of managing director and eventually have this lifestyle that I envision myself to have. And I think I was five years into my career when I realized kind of looking at my colleagues and also the people that I was working under, I don't really actually love their lifestyle. I don't like the fact that, you know, the hours are so long and I'm not in passion with my, with my work. It's not actually tangible. And at this time I started thinking, well, what is it out there for me? What can I actually lo look into as my alternative career? And I think at this point, you know, it's when I realized actually I don't have any hobbies outside of work. This is how hard I've been working to that point. And it, there's a lot of self-discovery and, you know, kind of self-reflection that's happening at that point. And by just being curious about the industries as a whole out, outside of what I do, um, I discovered digital because a friend of mine was actually sharing about what he did in a Facebook post. And again, coming back to the whole, you know, kind of coming full circle, I actually discovered about digital via social media. And at this point, I thought, you know what, this sounds really interesting. So I reached out to that friend of mine and we had a conversation about what he was working on in this agency. And he actually said, well, you know what? There's actually a guy I know in the London office that you can go and have a chat with. So I just went ahead and had a coffee catch up with him, a very casual one, and pretty much like an informational interview, right? As what you have in the old days. And he told me all about, you know, kind of what the, the kind of job entails and in terms of what they're working on. I was like, wow, this sounds like a really interesting area. I never knew you could actually build a career by doing something so fun. And I think that's when I started to embrace the idea of fun being part of my, my, um, my overall aim in life in that, you know, function, right? That word itself in terms of what we do. Fun is actually the, the top three letters in front of it, in front of that word. So if you embrace that concept, then you can actually enjoy what you're doing and be able to do, be much better at it in, in the long term. And at that point, you know, actually um, a lot of things happened behind the scenes. I started to kind of doing a lot of testing and optimizing in terms of my own social media profiles, playing with them because I was just curious about how this whole area is unfolding. And this is actually the early days when there was only Facebook and Twitter as the main platform. You know, you remember the days when Facebook was still called the Facebook.com? That's kind of how old I am. <laughs> and um, from that point on, you know, they actually had a, a position opening up a few months on the line in my friend's team. And they thought my professional background in banking worked really well in terms of the client facing side, serving the clients on that team, but albeit from a much more digital perspective. So I essentially took a step back and started from scratch all over again in the whole new industry. And I think that's when I feel like my entire career trajectory changed in the sense that I was working on something I'm finally interested in and passionate to actually learn more about over time. And I think that ties back again and again in terms of why I see in my own career and my own um, development so far in my own businesses and also other people that I, I've actually mentored or worked with in the sense that if you're passionate about what you do, you ultimately will, will be able to reach the you know, the kind of success and a level of success that you want to have in your industry, because you're just naturally reaching out for more new connections, learning about the new strategies, um, you know, embracing new concepts, and again, just being much more innovative. So from that point on, I started to build my career in digital marketing. And this is when I started learning all the dark arts behind the theories, the practicalities, and how businesses can actually apply this in a very new evolving area. And a few years later, I realized that um, there's actually a really big gap in the market between those who um, are in the smaller business end where they want to leverage the digital knowledge applying to what they do, but don't have the budget to pay for the larger agency fees. 
And that's where I realized I could actually freelance um, for those kind of clients. So I started doing that as a side hustle while in the weekends and the evenings, which I really enjoyed actually, because I got to work on so many different industries, uh, different areas that are actually in need of this um, specific service. So that's when I started taking on more and more clients, the point that eventually I made the leap to go from my corporate career in digital marketing into doing freelancing. And then I started building my freelancing business and I started to realize that I'm only one person. I can only do certain amounts of hours up to a certain capacity. Um, and no matter how efficient I could get or productive I could get, I'm sure you know this, Katie, is that, you know, unfortunately there, there's a ceiling, right? So from that point on, then that's when I realized I need to scale my business. And I realized at this point, the only way to scale is to actually create technically copies of myself, essentially courses that I can record, which kind of talks about the basic knowledge of social media, digital marketing that others can actually purchase and then start to learn from that anywhere in the world from any device, which is pretty powerful. And other things like digital products. So for instance, templates like social media content calendars that others can buy and then actually apply to what they do straight away. And that's when I realized the only way to do that is then start to build an online audience behind who I am as a person and a personal brand. So this whole evolution of going from corporate career into freelancing, into then becoming essentially an online business owner of my own knowledge and expertise. I think that's a really interesting evolution over time that I never would have envisioned from the start. But um, as I start to progress through that journey, I realized that this is actually a really interesting way to grow your own expertise into a business. For sure. And I think it's so interesting that the transition between freelance and business owner, it's also a mindset and identity shift, which is fascinating. And I'm curious, when you started building your own audience, what sort of struggles did you come across? Are they the same as the struggles most people have in terms of building an audience? Absolutely. Great question, Katie. I think one of the things that I start off with as a mistake, and I'm sure many of you guys might relate to this, is that you get so excited that you start registering an account on every single social media platform out there. And as we know, with these platforms, they are essentially a content machine, right? And you have to constantly keep feeding content in and out all day, every single day. And as a single, as a single solo entrepreneur, um, you can easily get burned out by that. And if you think about it this way, is that on average for a larger brands like Nike or Adidas, they actually have a whole entire team managing social media content across these different platforms. So the amount of work and, and the amount of, um, you know, kind of productivity that has to go in the back of that to go into feeding these content machines is immense. So that's why I always recommend if you can, starting off with just two or three, maximum three, even two is more than enough of social media platforms that you want to dominate on and concentrate and start growing. Because what you can always do is then move those existing audiences that you build over time by really concentrating your effort on being there for them, showing up daily. Eventually, move that audience to another platform that you want to build later on. But in the beginning, having less time and less, um, I suppose, content to actually feed into this is that you want to concentrate on where it matters. So where your audience actually hangs out. That's the second point is that I feel in the beginning, I didn't really know who my target audience was exactly. So having really pinned down that alignment between who I want to serve and who, where my audience actually lives. So, you know, a very clear example, let, let's say you're currently in the care home business. You wouldn't exactly go on TikTok or Snapchat to actually have a presence there because the actual age group of those audiences don't actually match. So I think that's a really key point is that one, to start with very little in terms of two or three platforms and to really just concentrate your effort there. And secondly, to so think about the alignment of the audiences as well. Yes, amazing. And I think it's something we've all struggled with. And I remember when I just started my business, I was convinced I'd, ha I'd do it all, right? I thought I'll have all social media and I'd have a podcast and a YouTube and all of this. Gradually, I have sort of gotten pretty much most of them. But had I begun with all of them in one go, there's no way because they're so different in terms of strategy and content and tools and yes and there's no point because also at the beginning you're figuring out other things at the beginning you're figuring out your offers and you're figuring out who you like to work with and 
when you're really beginning, like myself as a coach, I was figuring out my skills and my experience and how to coach people to a higher level. So yes, that's definitely fantastic advice in terms of when you begin building an audience. And you speak a lot about time. So, you know, managing your time, optimizing your time. And it's true. And this is something I'm also very passionate about in terms of productivity. So tell us, tell us the secrets. How can we optimize our time for social media and content creation in order to build an audience? Definitely. Great question, Katie, again. And I think with regards to this, it's definitely in terms of working smarter, not harder. And let me explain how that really works in social media land. So in my, in my example here, what I do every single week is that I have a pillar content. So a key larger piece of content that I produce that goes out to my audiences. So in my case here is a YouTube video. And for you, Katie, is a, is a podcast episode, isn't it? So when we do have that really keystone pillar content, we can actually leverage that content to chop it up into smaller pieces that we can feed on all of our social media channels in a short form content format. So for example, on Instagram um, and also on let's say TikTok, these are platforms where they're pushing out short form content like 30 second videos or 15 seconds at most to audiences. You can obviously make them longer if you want to up to 60 seconds, but I believe that attention span on these social media platforms are so low. And unfortunately, the only way to grab people's attention is to make sure you have a piece of content that's short, succinct, and actually very concise in terms of getting your point across and actually then grabbing people's attention, then they want to check out your long form content once they get that interest. So I think by doing that, not only you're saving time on creating more content for more platforms, but also you're promoting your keystone, your pillar content at the same time. So your online ecosystem is actually growing all together. So when they come across your YouTube channel, they might go then find out about you on your Instagram, on your LinkedIn, or they come across your podcast, for example, they do the same thing and vice versa. They might come across your short form, let's say a snippet of a really good insight that you shared about one of your guests on Instagram. And then they will come back to find out more about your full episodes and maybe even other episodes that they're interested in. So it's about that discovery process that we're capturing for our audiences from different channels. And they're jumping from place to place, but ultimately staying within your overall online ecosystem. So again, in that way, you save so much time and effort on having to create more content. But now you actually have an infinite amount of content you can use throughout the whole week. You explained this so clearly. <laughs> It's wonderful. Oh, it's, like, it's like, can I rewind two years in the past and listen to this message and save me a bunch of time and struggle, right? It's funny how sometimes these things, we, we don't know about them. Or I think we're so bombarded with so much different information all the time that mm. we get confused. And sometimes all it takes, and maybe someone listening to this right now will think, ah, oh, that's just what I needed to hear. And finally, I know what I'll do to optimize my time on social media to not spend so much time and energy creating content all the time. So that's definitely a wonderful way to put it. I'm also thinking, are there any other sort of underused methods that are highly efficient? So this would be one in terms of having that key pillar content and diffusing it on all the social media. But what other ways do you feel aren't used enough and can really optimize efficiency in terms of social media. Definitely. I think with regards to planning is another area that I see a lot of people want to do it, but we also want to do it, but actually processing it is a different thing. And I think it's all about coming down to systems. So if you have a really well-organized system of where your content lives in different pillars in terms of different content themes that you want to talk about. So for example, on my side of things, I talk about marketing, I talk about business, maybe something to do with my life as well, how that ties all together. And those are the three main pillars really that I talk about throughout my entire content. And I can always have a specific folder that organizes these different contents in that bucket. So for example, if I'm scheduling out my content for the next week, then I can say, okay, well, maybe I'll do a little bit of inspiration of business on Monday to get people revved up. On Tuesday, I might share a personal you know, story about how I got started. And on Wednesday, maybe I'll take out something from um, the, the content I'm sharing on YouTube, which is every Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I'll share a snippet from that to share on my social media channels, not only as a snippet of useful content, but also promoting 
my YouTube videos at the same time. And on Thursday, maybe do something personal again, where it talks about how my weeks has been. And on Friday, it could be a quote or maybe inspiration again, back in my audience. So again, it's about thinking how you want your week to look in terms of the overall content structure, and then how you're going to be organizing your content pillars. So what do you want to talk about? Now, whoever is listening to this, you might have a different type of business and you might have different content pillars that you can share, but the concept is the same, is that by having this idea in mind and having a system in place and actually a tool to also schedule your content. So one thing I recommend is looking at different tools that you like. So I think Buffer, for example, in my in my experience, has been really useful for me. It's a tool where you can use multiple channels at the same time, scheduling them out on your different social media platforms. And the other one's Hootsuite. So people either prefer one or the other. Buffer I like because there's actually a Chrome extension that you can install on your Chrome browser. And once you do go onto a piece of content you want to share, when you click that button on your Chrome browser, what it'll do is actually grab the headline of that content, grab the link to the content, and put it straight into a potential schedule post for you. And all you have to do is essentially type out the copy, the social media call to action that you want to say on that post, click schedule into queue, and that's now added into your social media queue. So it just makes the whole process super easy. So therefore, there's no friction. And I think whenever there's friction in terms of what we want to do, we don't do it. And that's something I found personally in my, in my life so far. So I tend to make it as easy as possible for myself to do it on a consistent basis, on a regular basis, that I can make sure that I top up my social media queue with content ideas and content posts that I'm ready to go out. So therefore, I feel like I can get on with doing what's important in my business, which is creating more products for my students, creating more courses that they might find useful. While I know that in the background, my social media is running for me. And I can always go back in and check in on comments and go back to the engagement that people have, have left on my content as well. So smart. And I loved what you said about friction. And I think it's so true. The less friction, the better. And this isn't just in business. It's also in life. The less friction, the better to start your exercise routine for meditation to everything. I feel that another part of friction is also the emotional friction. So for instance, someone that has maybe... Um, yes, doesn't like one platform or another, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or Twitter and has this sort of emotional barrier and friction that can also hold them back. And the reason I say this is pretty much at any given point, I disliked all of them, <laughs> right? I remember like LinkedIn yeah. years and years ago, I was like, oh, it's boring, don't fancy. Then I got into LinkedIn pretty fast. Instagram, I only started recently because for years I wasn't into Instagram because I thought people scrolled all the time. Uh, Twitter I saw was boring now I'm really enjoying Twitter I didn't used to want to have a YouTube now I have YouTube so now what I'm starting to see is I'm thinking about uh, building a Facebook group which I was always dead against but I'm starting to realize that all this friction is probably just the other sort of side of the coin of fear or or reluctance or something and that that doesn't mean don't do it so I guess what I'm trying to say is if you have any sort of friction or emotional friction towards an aspect in your business or social media or anything, really consider, is it worth not doing? I kind of regret I didn't start my Twitter and my Instagram a bit sooner or, you know, maybe a Facebook group, et cetera. So I think, or well, same with the email list also. So I feel that all these things are really good if we just, you know, do things that we enjoy on them and interact with people that we like and follow content that's enjoyable. All these things are, depends on the energy we put in. I don't know what your thoughts on this. I kind of, I kind of went on a riff, but I, that word friction really sort of <laughs> inspired me. I love that, Katie. And you actually touched on a really good point there because I feel like a lot of times people tend to stay away from social media platforms, like you said, because they don't enjoy it and they see a negative aspect of it. And it's all about our mindsets, right? How do we want to embrace social media in the right way? And I talk about this a lot, actually, on my Instagram uh, channels and also on LinkedIn, I'm sure you've seen, is that it's how we think about curating the right environment on social media for ourselves. Like you said there, by following the right people. So what we see in our feed actually affects, it really affects us psychologically in different ways. Um, I remember the old days, you know, this is the old Lori, the younger Lori, where I would just follow influencers all the time who have these perfect, you know, lifestyles and jet setting, you know, around the world, or maybe showcasing the, the latest cars. 
And that doesn't exactly do very well for your psychological comparison itis, right? Where we all naturally compare, as the pastor Steve Fursick have said, our um, the struggle, the, the reason why we struggle with our insecurity is because we compare our behind the scenes with someone else's highlight reel. Because people only share a lot of times the best of their life on social media. And if we see that as the reality, that can actually lead us down to a very dark path, I think. Whereas if we see everything, you know, from the surface of what it is, and just believe in the sense that we're here to create impact with our knowledge, with what we know, and we're, we're here to create positivity on social media platforms from our accounts, from those that follow us in our community, then we come from a di very different place. So we know that we have a purpose here. Whereas if we show on social media where we're just constantly, like you said, they're scrolling through content, consuming content all the time, that may not even do very well for our own personal development, then I feel like that doesn't actually add to any purpose in what we do. And it can become a, quickly a very big time suck, right? As you can tell, um, I think on average, they said that the research, people spend, I think, 85 minutes on TikTok um, on a daily basis, just scrolling nonstop. And I think I really encourage everyone who are using social media to think of it from a very positive place. And how can we leverage the power of social media, right? To reach more people, to spread our mission, spread our message in the right way and creating a very positive community for everyone in, in general. And also think about who do you wanna follow? Who's your influencer in your space that you feel like has a positive effect on your life? And you wanna see their message daily because that reminds you to be the person that you wanna become as well. Absolutely, 100%. It's all about the intention we put in behind and off, off air just before we were talking about Mel Robbins and I was mentioning this post I saw of her. And this is the sort of thing that if you follow, it brings you up because she wasn't just showcasing her amazing lifestyle or new car. She was saying how when she began on self-publisher book, she screwed up a bunch and yet it still did well. So the message behind that is saying, even if it's imperfect, still take action and you're going to be great sort of thing. I'm, I'm making a caricature, but I feel that these sort of messages, they're inspiring, they're motivational, they're also helpful in many ways. So they, it does affect us a lot psychologically, what we do on social media, who we follow, how long we spend on it, even for business. If we spend too much, it can be, um, I think, Yes, it loses its impact somehow. So I feel that the intention is what matters most. While we're talking about growing your audience, because I know this is what you specialize in, what do you feel are some of the greatest myths around growing your audience? What do you feel are some of the myths, myth, which is a really hard word to pronounce? It <laughs> I was is, practicing it? I off air before because <laughs> I think it's a nice question. Uh, I don't always ask this, but sometimes in someone's fields, I'm interested in their myth. So what are some of the greatest myths about growing your audience? Yeah, definitely. And I think the biggest one, to be honest, is definitely the size of the audiences. I think a lot of times we tend to see number, right, as a as a metric of our successes. So, you know, you see someone with, let's say, 100,000 or a million followers, and all of a sudden you think, well, this person's made it. You know, that's it. Amazing. But actually, we need to see more behind the scenes of how that, what that metric actually tells us and overall metric of everything else behind that as well. So what I mean by this is, let's say behind those a million followers, less than 0.0001% of them actually do um, take action on the back of what this potential account or influencer or whoever that might be is saying, then technically you're not doing very much with that overall audience size. This audience is not very much engaged with what you have to share as a mission, as a message, as a business. Um, Vice versa, if you look at the other side, where let's say you only have 300 or 1,000 people who are diehard loyal fans following you on every single platform you're on, and no matter what you say or, you know, in terms of what kind of things that you're putting out in terms of your products, your services, or even a brand new book, for example, they're there to support it because they truly believe in your message and they want to rally behind it then that becomes much more powerful over time to have a smaller, albeit much more engaged audiences. I think that's where the power of audience building comes from is, is you want to build that loyalty, that trust, that like, know, and trust factor into your audience as you're starting from scratch. So I'm not saying that, you know, when you reach a certain number, you become successful. And that's exactly why I feel like a lot of times people feel that way from other maybe marketing gurus have told them you know, go post on social media every single day, build that audience, you know, that kind of stuff. But I feel like ultimately it comes down to 
who are you building it for? And, you know, in term, it's not about the size, but rather about what's your overall message and what do you want your audience to, to rally behind? And when you have an overall movement, right, a, a why behind you, I think that becomes m- much more powerful for someone to believe in you, to be part of that overall community as well. Um, and the other thing I think I want to touch on is, I'm going off a bit tangent here, but I really, I, I want to touch on this concept of um, leverage. So I read a book recently, um, which I should have read a long time ago, but I loved this book by Naval Ravikant, which is the Al- Alamak of Naval Ravikant. It's a mouthful, um, but um, I didn't know about him actually, but he's actually a tech investor um, and he talks a lot you know, in terms of the overall angel investing and everything behind how we can create a future that's future proof in this book. And one of the things he talk about is in the old days, the first form of leverage comes from labor, right? You have the pharaohs in the old days where they control a large kind of slave um, uh, work culture, where then they moved on to capitalism. So capital is the second leverage where you have the John D. Rockefellers, right? Where we have these kind of big banking magnets um, who are then able to control capital. Then they moved on to code into the 2000s, where a lot of the tech, you know, kind of developments we've seen in terms of the online space have really boomed. I think now the fourth leverage is a deathly audience, because we've seen that with content creators, where with anyone who wants to generate um, an audience behind their overall mission, their own message, by having an, an audience that truly believe in what you have to uh, what, you, what you say and what you have to do is that then that audience becomes much more powerful in sharing that message for you in all of their networks and their family and friends. And I think having audience now the true leverage going forward from this year and beyond. And that's something that I believe everyone should think about in the long-term strategies. For sure. I think it's so powerful. And apart from anything else, it's the easiest and the most impactful way to share your mission or your vision. And like you said, even with the small group, if it's a small group of people and you're all dedicated to, you know, promote the value of stoicism and you're just, you know, tweeting about stoicism regularly. I follow a bunch of people who talk about stoicism on Twitter a lot, for example. And so I think that this is really key and essential nowadays. And I loved what you said about numbers because I've definitely gotten caught up more than once with the whole number game. And recently I felt really pressurized because for a while, I was only on LinkedIn and have almost like 5K followers and, and I post all the time and engage. But then because I was starting my Instagram and Twitter from scratch, I kept thinking oh, all the people who join me there or follow me there, they'll see I have like 100 followers and it made me feel small. And it's so silly. And I realized that on Twitter, for instance, like the stoicism guys that I mentioned, I'm really enjoying the content. I'm enjoying the interaction. I'm feeling they're engaging almost more with my content sometimes than on LinkedIn, even though I have a way smaller following. And so I thought, ah, oh, this is interesting because I'm actually enjoying this and my following is really small, but I feel like I'm getting to know certain people. I'm getting used to seeing certain people tweet even more, I think, somehow than LinkedIn. So I guess I'm just confirming what you said around it's not a numbers game, but it's more a relationships game. And by this, I mean, you know, who are the people that you're following and that are inspiring you? Who are the people you want to inspire? Who are the people that you're building connections with, collaborating, like we are right now on the podcast. And I think this matters so much more. And it also leads me, because I felt it was also highly related with uh, income, because I feel, especially for a coach or someone that works on the online world, your online presence and how much you earn can be, Uh, related and I also thought about it's what you were saying about numbers that you know if someone is earning x amount of money every month but has balance has hobbies has some time off has boundaries around when they finish versus someone who's earning double or triple that whatever the number may be but who's working around the clock who's super stressed who's overwhelmed then which one is really successful right because I feel that nowadays the default for success, it's a bit like the default for successful audience is numbers. And I feel that's the same. The default for success would be the highest number. And I don't think that's true. Someone that earns a lot can be very successful too, but I feel there are other parameters. And I think it all comes down uh, in the case of uh, personal and professional success to how we feel. And you posted about this the other day. And I really love that because like I said, I'm working on it about enjoying the journey. So maybe this could be the sort of nice note to wrap up on what are your thoughts around around this part about enjoying the journey and not 
just focusing on that abstract, amazing、uh, goal. <laughs> That's so true, Katie. And actually, this reminded me of another book that I've been reading recently called "The Psychology of Money." And、uh, in there, I think I really resonated with that message about freedom. So he said that in terms of freedom, it could be worth. It's probably one of your most, you know, valuable commodity in the sense that the freedom to do what you want to do with your time. So that's more valuable than making money. More valuable than you know having all the fame and success in the world. Because just having the freedom to do what you want with your time, that itself is wealth and money in its own sense. I, I found that so profound because, like I said in that post, where you know it's not so much about achieving that short-term goal, but it's rather about thinking how am I going to be having fun? Like I said in the early part of this podcast, having fun, but also enjoying the journey along the way, and that allows you to have much more longevity. In what you do, right? You can carry on much further than someone who's not who's burned out in the meantime and not really enjoying that what they're working on, even though it's making them so much money and so much fame. Imagine how miserable of a life that could be, right? And and that really made me reflect on essentially the early part of my my career. It, it was very prestigious to be walking into an investment bank as a financial analyst in those days, and of course, people all around me, my family and friends. They were all cheering up, cheering me on, saying how amazing it is that you're having a lifestyle of living like this. But deep down, I knew I wasn't happy, and deep down, I knew that I didn't have the freedom to do what I want to do with my time. And I think that's where it really kind of made me reflect and to think about what is it that I want to do in the long term, that I'm able to maintain that longevity, have a career that I'm passionate about,、um, and that's where eventually led me down this path. So exactly like you said, Katie, is that. How do we actually embrace that concept of embracing more freedom, in terms of what we do either on in our businesses, in our life, on social media as well, right? So enjoying the process of building our audiences on social media, rather than thinking about the vanity metrics, thinking about the、um, the content that we need to constantly put out, you know, kind of just having the right mindset and being there for your for your audiences, for your community. I think that's really key. Amazing! I think that's such a perfect note. I almost felt like you know stopping the recording there and then. Thank you so much, Laurie. You've shared so much value, so many important and amazing insights. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Laurie. Thank you for having me, Katie. It's great to be here. <laughs>